honestly, you study up for exam three, you're pretty much ready for exam four. None of this stuff is very difficult to wade through at all. Um, it's, you know, you kind of get to this point, it's just a, a fact here, a fact there. It's just like, you read it, you know, it, you're good. Right. Um, at least that's kind of the way I feel. It goes very quickly. Kind of one off. Oh, drinks in the way of the camera. Kind of little one off things on each section. There's not a whole lot of big sections anymore. So let's check it out. <clears throat> so we begin with uh, week 13. I don't know. Yeah, week something. Whatever this week is. 12. Government auditing standards. We've mentioned before when we had a little section about the Government Accountability Office. Uh, there's not a whole lot more to mention here. Um, just little tidbits in these next few sections. Just a little bit of read it, be a little bit familiar and, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, Generally, there are generally accepted government auditing standards. Gagas. Yeah, people say that. Or gagas. I don't know. I don't say it. I don't like it. But um, I've always heard people say gagas, but the person on the video said it some other way that I've never heard before. So you never know. You know, people call PCAOB peekaboo. They'll bound to call thing peek. Things, anything. I hate that. Don't call P A P C A O B peekaboo. I'll come haunt you. You don't say that, do you? <laughs> no, but it sounds just like Pikachu, and I hate somebody gave <laughs> up that opportunity. That's funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've got gas that we're familiar with. This is generally accepted government auditing standards. It is. There's more requirements here. You'll hear people refer to this as yellow book, and government audits. You'll hear them refer to them as yellow book audits. I've done a tremendous number of these. Um, so, you know, we had to get additional, there were additional CPE or continuing education requirements for us um, to be able to do these government audits. There are additional requirements in the audit itself. Um, so, yeah, so I just kind of highlighted a few um, in every financial audit governmental entity. Um, there is a requirement to include a written report as well on internal control. So that's kind of a new thing. Um, I highlighted that in green because I feel like that's a, a good typical test question. Um, not that some of the others wouldn't be, but I really highlighted that one because it's like, yeah, that's a good one. Um, there'll also be a written report on compliance with laws and regulations and things like that. Um, we have additional duties here to report fraud, to report illegal acts, to report abuse. This time we have a duty perhaps to report to authorities outside the entity. You know, governments are different and you know, they're, uh, we gotta, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we gotta watch them, <laughs> we gotta watch them. They, re you know, people hold them accountable and we want to make sure that uh, everything's good because they're spending our money taxpayers. Right. So we would have that additional duty to report those things outside of the entity when management um, fails to appropriately respond. That's what, um, so that's a duty of ours. If they're not responding appropriately, that's a good test question too. Um, so I'll highlight that too. And we have a duty to report any known illegal acts that could result in criminal prosecution. So some new little things for uh, a government audit. And then we got single audits. So um, we did a lot of single audits too. This applies to state or local governments that have expenditures of federal assistance money. So grants and things like that of at least 750,000 a year. Um, that might be an important number to note. Um, that's just kind of one of those, 
things we know in the governmental audit world, world it's like, oh, we may be underseeing a lot of here. They were spending, you know, 750. So it's kind of an important number. Uh, I would maybe take note of that for test question purposes. Maybe, maybe not. It's not hard to remember that number. Um, and then when you're under the Single Audit Act, there's even more requirements. You've got to do additional testing on internal control. You got to do additional testing on each of the major programs that are identified. And that's a whole ordeal that I think way beyond the scope of what we need to worry about here. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's it's a big it's a big process. I remember doing them. They get they get complex and a bit overwhelming. But materiality. When you're, uh, when you're doing this, it's determined separately for each financial assistance program. And we'll look for compliance with the requirements of those programs. So it's just additional requirements for those large expenditures of grant money and things like that. That's about it. Um, you know, this is, like I said, these questions or these sections are more of a read over this and get a little bit of a familiarity with them and you'll probably be good to go. Um, they put a ton of questions on this from this section. Some good, some not. I think most of, you know, the good thing about a lot of these is, yeah, it's a question for this section, but really it draws on information we know from previous things, right? For example, number four, Auditors report on internal controls and compliance with laws and regulations in accordance with government auditing standards is required to include what? All right. Well, you know what? Make that sentence of the auditors report on blank and we're good with these answers. Would it include the scope of the auditors testing of internal controls? Yeah. Spoke a little system. We don't always have to test internal controls, but if it was an engagement where we did, obviously we would include that. Do we include uncorrected misstatements that were determined by management to be immaterial? And this is an easy, this pops up in a lot of different areas of test questions. Immaterial means we do not care, period. So, if something's immaterial, you might as well pretend like it doesn't exist. Nobody cares. Immaterial by definition means nobody cares. So uh, if there are uncorrected misstatements that are determined to be immaterial, um, that we wouldn't include that on the auditor's report, right? So A is the answer that a report would include this, not that. So we could answer that whether we knew about the governmental stuff or not, right? We can draw on our previous knowledge. Um, number six is kind of a typical type question, I feel like, which of the following is correct about government audits. And they like to hit on this fact that in government audits, there may be circumstances where you are required to report fraud and illegal acts to someone outside of the audited entity. So take note of that. That's an important, important concept there. Number 17, same deal, you know, in governmental audit, an auditor most likely would be required to report a falsification of accounting records directly to a federal inspector general. In other words, someone outside of the entity when the falsification is what? So this carries it a little bit a different direction from number six. This is a more of a question of when would you do this? When you would do that is when management didn't handle them the way they need to, right? So when the falsification is communicated by the auditor and the to the auditee and the auditee fails to make the required report of the matter, that's when we're required to go outside of the entity and say, these people aren't doing it right. I feel like there's a ton of questions here for such a short section all of them are pretty straightforward and any of them are probably potential CPA questions. So have a look at them, but they're all just kind of really straightforward. So um, kind of highlighted the super important ones for sure. Yeah. So 
that's government auditing standards. 19 questions they gave us. All right, compliance audits. So quick and easy here, <laughs> real quick and easy. <clears throat> so here we're reporting on whether an entity complied, compliance audit. Uh, always in material respects, right? Here we're testing whether they complied with whatever the compliance requirements are. So, you know, compliance auditing is usually for seeing whether a company is following some kind of external regulation, uh, something like, e are they following EPA guidelines? Something like, are they following health and safety guidelines? Something like, are they following guidelines to protect data, security of data and kind of, you know, things like that. <clears throat> um, and then it kind of goes on from there to be, you are auditing this. We know what auditing is. So we know we've got to test mess and gather evidence and stuff. You know, these questions or these sections get kind of repetitive on saying the same things. We've got to gain an understanding of this. Of course we do, right? Yeah, just yeah, any any kind of regulate regulatory requirements. They don't um, have specific, huh? They don't have specific people that do like they don't have OT people that audit that they account for them to do that too. Um well they do it in some order of Do I know? Do they do it as part of like financial risk analysis? So I'm trying to think how I'm trying to say this. Um, you know, a lot of times an audit. So I remember auditing governments and they're like, oh no, the auditors are coming. And you know, they were telling us the story. They said, oh no, these are the auditors that are here to help us. <laughs> you know, these, are, these are not the people trying to get us in trouble, right? So I think that's kind of the difference. The auditors are trying to help them not get in trouble. For, for these things, you know, like we're auditing to see, you know, are they in compliance? And of course they're issuing a report that'll show that they are and everything in compliance. But yeah, um, yeah, that's kind of the difference there. You know, you know, IRS audits people and they're trying to bust them for something, right? So, you know, audit kind of gets a bad connotation, but you know, when we're working for a local firm and we're doing an audit for somebody, we're not the bad guys really. We're just doing this for them. They hired us to do this. Now, government audit's different. They're required to get a government audit, right? But we're, it's not an adversarial thing. We are there and we're friendly and we're trying to help them correct any issues that might be there. Now, we'll issue audit findings and report them and everything. And But, you know, the whole point is transparency for sure, but also to give them, you know, to make them aware of it and hopefully they can correct it. And, you know, it's all supposed to make us better, right? So <clears throat> uh, with the report, um, they can issue it and you'll see this in a few of these sections. I don't know why I particularly noted it, but it could be a separate report on compliance only. It could be a separate report on internal control over compliance, or it could be a combined report on compliance and internal control over compliance. And you'll see that similar language used in a few of these sections. Um, that's about it. I don't have much else. There's no questions in this section, so yeah, we won't answer any. And then we kind of hop into general principles of the review standards. So these are statements on standards for accounting and review services. So um, we're hitting a different area now. So these are still issued by the ASCPA uh, and they apply to three different engagements. So these don't apply to audits, obviously. These apply to compilations, which we'll talk about, reviews, which we'll talk about, and preparations, which we'll talk about. So um, these are what fall under the review standards.
and there's not a whole lot of meat to this particular section. They talk about when to and to not accept an engagement under these standards. Um, we wouldn't accept an engagement, and this is kind of like, of course, we wouldn't, right? If independence will not be satisfied. Now, we don't have to be independent under all of these engagements. We do have to be for a review, but we don't have to be for a compilation, and we don't have to be for a preparation. But if it's a review engagement, we shouldn't accept it if we're not independent, is what they're saying there. Uh, we wouldn't want to accept an engagement if the information needed to perform the engagement is unlikely to ever be available or reliable. Obvious things, right? And the classic thing we've talked about all semester, or not all semester, but early on, we don't want any part of any engagement when we don't think management has the integrity. We don't want to be a part of that. That's going to put us in a bad situation, right? So... The good thing about some of these later sections are same old thing, different engagement, right? So you just kind of, as you're preparing your notes, you just kind of weed those things out and just kind of put the new information in there and just kind of trust yourself to know, obviously, if they ask me a question about a review, whether to accept it, and the answer is about management integrity, I'm going to know that, whether it's about a review or an audit where I took notes on it earlier in the semester, right? So, yeah, don't crowd out your notes with just repetitive stuff uh, unless you want to. You know, you may like that structure. I don't. I like to not repeat stuff that I already feel like I know. Um, so in this little summary section, there's a few questions, but not many. Oh, there were two questions in compliance audits. There weren't. These were old, I think, that got deleted, didn't they? Did y'all see questions? I have a note that they got deleted. Y'all don't remember. Uh, I don't think these were in there anymore. I think they're gone. I think I had them in my old document, forgot to delete them. If not, y'all got them on your Wiley packet anyway. I don't think those are there anymore. Uh, these were quite easy and honestly, not probably worth our time. Uh, you're just talking about the body that issues the things. It's too easy of a question. Probably even get asked on a CPA exam. Three is a good one, though. Um, a CPA is required to comply with the provisions of the review standards. When do they need to? When they're processing financial data for clients. Oh, that's not an attestation service at all, right? And it's not a comp it's not a compilation, it's not a review, it's not a preparation. That's just processing data. So no, that doesn't fall into there. Neither does consulting services. So I can see us getting this question and being tempted to answer yes to something here, but no, it's neither of these falls under that category. So if you're thinking statements on standards for accounting and review services, you're thinking three things: compilation. Preparation, review, that's it, easy to remember. So yeah, three is a good question that I could see happening. Um, this is kind of a throwback to an earlier section, unconditional requirements, I mean to hit bold on that. So I don't know why they decided to include it here again. Preparations of financial statements. All right, so there's a so we've got preparations and we got compilations. These are our next two sections. The difference is somewhat subtle-ish, and honestly, this section here, preparation of financial statements, that's a new thing from not too long ago. That you know, this wasn't a section that I would have studied for when I was studying for the CPA exam. It just kind of wasn't a thing. Um, but all it is is taking the client's financial data and turning it into financial statements. That, yeah, it is what it says it is. We are preparing financial statements for them. We don't have to be independent because we're not offering any assurance on these things. We are just taking their trial balance and cranking out balance sheet, income statement, cash flows, whatever, right? Um, the financial statements themselves, that's what we're preparing. There's no report. 
that makes this a preparation as well. If it's a report, then we're compilation at that point. There's no report here. We just have financial statements. Each page will have a statement that there is no assurance provided. And that's really the key part of that sentence. They also have a little what if. If we didn't, I guess it's kind of an alternative. If we didn't include that, we would need to issue a disclaimer to make the point clear, but that's more trouble. Just put on each page that no assurance is provided. Uh, we don't even need to identify the accountant's name or the firm name. As the accountant, what are we required to do? We need, and listen to this, an appropriate understanding. Why would we ever not need an appropriate understanding? So we need an appropriate understanding of the financial reporting framework that's to be used. Of course we would. So why would we be able to do a financial statement package of something we don't even know what the framework is and understand it? So that's just kind of a throwaway line there, but I put it in there anyway. If we are assisting management with significant judgments, again, this is obvious, we should discuss the judgments with management so that management understands and can take responsibility for them because this is totally management's responsibility. If there are known departures in the financial statements, it should be disclosed in the financial statements. If they, in our determinations, are meant to mislead, we say, nope, obviously, right? So there's really obvious things here. We are cranking out financial statements as a preparation. And then a list of obvious things that either do or do not need to happen, right? The only real thing that's not super obvious maybe is this right here, right? Everything else, well, I mean, this is probably one of the most important concepts here that I could see a test question from. The rest of this is just kind of common, not common sense, but using our basis of knowledge that we already have and just applying it to this area, we would know, right? Questions from this chapter are, there's two of them. Which of the following situations prevents an accountant from preparing financial statements that omit substantially all disclosures required by the framework? A says the accountant is not independent. We don't have to be independent. B says we become aware that this was omitted with the intention of misleading users of the financial statements. Why would that not be the answer, right? So pretty quick and easy. And number two is one of the most confusing, horribly written questions ever. The statements applicable to preparation engagements do not apply to the following engagements except for, I'm sitting there, what does that mean? It does not apply to all of these except for what? So that translates to, I'm still trying to work it out in my head, which of these does it apply to, right? Now, is that right? Yeah. Horribly written question. Easy once you figure out what the heck they're saying, but that I guess would be a double negative, right? Do not apply to these engagements except for what? They should just say, does apply to this, right? So horribly written question, but it does apply to preparing financial statements to be presented alongside a personal financial plan. Um, that's a horribly written question. It makes my head spin. I don't like it. Moving on. Compilations is almost the same thing. Subtle differences. Um, so a compilation is what it's supposed to be is management's already prepared the financial statements. We're helping them present them along with a, an accompanying report. And our report has no assurance about those financial statements. So that's kind of the subtle difference. The key difference is there's a report. <laughs> that's kind of your takeaway. Um, that's the key difference. There is a compilation report. 
Uh, we don't have to be independent because we're not providing any, assur any assurance. I added this here, something to note. An engagement letter for a compilation engagement often contains language such as, you agree to hold us harmless and to release, indemnify, and defend us from any liability or costs, including attorney's fees resulting from management's knowing misrepresentations to us. Um, not sure why I noted that, but just felt like that could be, that could show up somewhere. You know, that that's the type of thing that might come up. But our responsibility, hey, obtain an understanding, of course. Read the financial statements. Mm, evaluate whether they are free of obvious material misstatements. We're not giving any assurance. We're just reading them over them and looking for things that just kick us in the tail, right? Propose any appropriate revisions if we discover a need for revisions. So kind of obvious things, no more than this. This is not a big engagement. Um, the report that we issue is going to have the same old thing about management being responsible for the stuff. There's going to be a statement that we perform the compilation in accordance with those standards. We're going to have a statement that we did not audit, did not review the statements and no assurance is provided. We want to be very clear on that. That is super important right there. And then we're going to disclaim an opinion or any form of assurance. And then signature. Um, we don't have to be independent. If we are not, and this one, this is test question city right here for some reason it seems to be. If we're not in independent, that's fine. We can still do this engagement, but we need a statement in the report or somewhere that uh, we're not independent. So that is a good test question. I would definitely take note of that one. Um, <clears throat> and a few little odds and ends here at the end. If the financial statements are prepared and substantially all the disclosures are omitted, our compilation report should include a paragraph pointing that out, including a statement that the financial statements are not designed for those who are uninformed about such matters. Um, if there are, you know, we mentioned earlier about material departures need, needing to be part of the financial statements, you know, in the notes. If there are material departures that are not disclosed in the notes, like they're supposed to be, then we'll modify the compilation report in a separate paragraph. Like that. And this last one's important. Um, we shouldn't add a statement to the report stating that the financial statements are not in conformity with the app because you're saying too much there, right? Um, we're expressing some kind of a conclusion. So I think that would be obvious that we wouldn't do that because we don't know if it's, that that's true. We don't know whether or not it's true. We haven't done any tests to get any evidence to figure that out. So we definitely wouldn't want to make that statement. So. I think we would have all known that. So that's a compilation. Um, 12 questions in this section. Uh, I thought some of these beginning with number four, kind of more of the typical hot spots. Um, four, you know, this is the type of question you should be able to answer based on seeing this type of question several times, right? Uh, however, you know, there's at least one, maybe two similar type questions in our test bank in here. And I still see a few miss them here and there, but not that often. But four says an accountant has been engaged to compile the financial statements of a non-public entity. These financial statements contain many departures from GAAP because of inadequacies in the accounting records. The accountant believes that modification of the compilation report you know, we just said 
we would modify the compilation report under these circumstances. Here it says the county believes that modification of the compilation report is not adequate to indicate all these deficiencies. Under these circumstances, we're not doing anything else, right? We're like, we can't do this, we're out of here. We withdraw. That is not a fixable circumstance, right? Kind of like withdrawing from an engagement when management lacks integrity, right? So we're done. There's no further service for these financial statements. The other answer choices. No, obviously we wouldn't do any of those other three things. Five's an important one. Uh, we've mentioned and highlighted it already, but here it is in the form of a question. An accountant compiled the financial statements of a non-issuer in accordance with the standards. If accountant has ownership interest in the entity, in other words, they're not independent, which of the following statements is correct? So we said they don't have to be independent to do this. They just have to say that they're not independent. So we are required in part D, answer D, to include a statement, I am not independent with respect to the entity compilation report. We don't have to refuse it. We don't have to issue this disclaimer that I am an owner, owner of the entity. We just have to say I'm not independent. So that's important, a little hot spot. This one, number six, is kind of a hot spot. Which of the following services, if any, may an accountant who is not independent provide? Compilations, fine, but not reviews, right? We hadn't talked about reviews, but we did mention that a minute ago. So don't have to worry about independence if it's a compilation or a preparation. Do have to be independent for a review. Eight is one of these classic, easy to screw up questions that you'll see over and over because it's just like, I don't know, intuition kicks in. You know, well, here's the question. An accountant was asked by a potential client to perform a compilation of its financial statements. The accountant is not familiar with the industry in which the client operates. In this situation, which of the following actions is the accountant most likely to take? So, you know, intuition kind of kicks in. You're like, well, if they don't know, then they don't need to do it. But that's not the answer. The answer is if they don't know, they need to learn. So you accept the engagement and then obtain the adequate level of knowledge. All right. We don't know, we can learn. That's kind of an easy question to miss, but it's a very common question. So you put a star by that one. We don't have to decline that engagement. And we don't have to postpone accepting it. We can accept and then learn. Uh, 11, before issuing a report on the compilation of financial statements, the accountant should what? So I kind of highlight this because this is another typical type setup. They're giving you three things that you don't even have to do in a compilation and then one that you do. So in a compilation, we don't have to do analytical procedures on selected financial data to look for misstatements. We don't have to corroborate any kind of sample of assertions. We don't have to do these inquiries. All we really have to do is read the financial statements and uh, look for anything that jumps out at us. Obvious material errors, it says. That's a good one. All right, that's compilation. Pretty straightforward, no problem. Very good. What's next, reviews. Yep. Okay, reviews, that's quick and easy to talk about too. So review is a very scaled down version of an audit. You're gonna do procedures, but not much. You'll do a little bit. So that's that's not a very fancy way of saying what a review is, but that's essentially what it is. 
you are doing a little bit of work and giving a little bit of assurance. That's essentially what a review is. You'll give what's called limited assurance. And that translates to a report that says, um, we are not aware of any material modifications that should be made. So we're not gonna go so far as to say, in our opinion, the financial statements are blah, blah, blah. We're just gonna say, we did this and we're not aware of anything that needs to be done. That's a review. So starting at the top here, review engagement involves obtaining limited assurance about whether material modifications should be made to the financial statements. We do have to be independent because we're giving some assurance here. A compilation and a preparation, no assurance. Here, a little bit. Negative assurance. Negative assurance is a good term. We're going to do a little bit of testing, primarily inquiries and analytical procedures, limited tests. Um, we would focus those tests on high risk areas. We should obviously obtain an understanding of the entity's business and accounting practices. We don't have to go so far as to gain an understanding of their internal control. We are not going that deep. We are making inquiries of management. We don't have to corroborate any of that. We should read the financial statements like we do in the compilation for any departures. We should verify that financial statements do agree to the accounting records. And we're going to get a rep letter from management. So that is a review. Very limited. Um, you gave us a lot of questions, a lot of easy questions. Um, well, number four. It, you know, with any of these sections that give a sample report, I always like reading those because you kind of notice some things and you'll get, you know, those reports are very descriptive of what's going on in that type of engagement. So you kind of get the material again where it talks about the manager's responsibilities, our responsibilities. This thing we did is for the purpose of doing this. And you know, it's really good to read those reports and take notes about them. Number four questions us about the review report. Uh, CPA started to audit the financial statements of a non-issuer. After completing certain audit procedures, the client requested the CPA to change the engagement to a review because of a scope limitation. The CP, this is a story we don't need. Uh, the CPA concludes there is reasonable justification for the change. Under these circumstances, the CPA's review report should include a what? So strike all of that. And the question really is, uh, in a review, the re review report should include a statement that the review is substantially less in scope than an audit. So you pick that up when you kind of read over the review report. So it's worth doing. And all this other stuff, you would probably know we don't have to do all this. We don't have to reference a scope limitation that calls the change engagement. We're, just, we're not doing an audit anymore. Scope's not limited for this engagement we're doing. We wouldn't have to describe the auditing procedures we did. We're not doing an audit anymore. Uh, number five, good one. Um, the inability of which of the following activities would most likely prevent us from doing a review. We mentioned the types of things you typically do in a review. If we're not able to do inquiries and analytical procedures. We don't have a review, right? These other things we don't have to do. We don't have to perform tests of details of balances. We don't have to obtain an understanding of internal control. We don't have to have previous experience in the industry. Things you could probably easily reason through. Good typical question though. <laughs> Six is, um, again, highlighting the fact that we don't have to gain an understanding of internal control. That must be important, right? To know that. Number seven. Again, test the typical type of thing you would do in a review. We said inquiries and analytical procedures. 
Here, they don't just flat out say analytical procedures. I can't talk. They give you a example of an analytical procedure. So which of the following would generally be performed when looking at the AR balance in a review? Would we perform a reasonableness test by computing this ratio? Heck yeah, it'd be great. Analytical procedure, easy one. Would we go so far as to do any of these other things? Are we gonna vouch a sample? No. Are we gonna confirm things? No. Are we gonna look at subsequent bank statements? No, this is audit stuff. We're just wanting to do a review. We're gonna crank out some analytical procedures and ask some questions. Number eight, here it is again, inquiry and analytical procedures. So take note of that for sure. Are ordinarily performed during a review of a, oh, and inquiry and analytical procedures are ordinarily performed. Reading it wrong. Inquiry and analytical procedures ordinarily performed include what? So that's another question of which of these is not too much. So A says inquiries concerning actions taken at meetings of the owners and those charged with governance. We definitely want to ask that question, right? And then B kind of tricks us a bit because they're like analytical procedures. And we're like, yeah, definitely analytical procedures. But this one they're describing is too much. This is an analytical procedure designed to test accounting records by obtaining corroborating evidence. That's too much for a review, whether they call it an analytical procedure or not. D calls it an analytical procedure here. This one's concerning management assertions regarding existence. That's too much for a review. C is inquiries, but these are inquiries designed to identify significant deficiencies in internal control. We're not in the business of doing that in a review. It's a very good question with some subtleties that you need to kind of read carefully. <clears throat> uh, 11. This is just a basic question, but kind of important. Standard review report would state what A says we don't express an opinion or or any form of limited assurance. We know that's not true, right? The report should say, we're not aware of any material modifications that should be made. That's what it should say. That is called negative assurance. We're not gonna say, we examine evidence on a test basis. We didn't do that. We're not gonna say we obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement. We didn't go that far. We're just going to say we're not aware of any material modifications. <clears throat> Questions on reviews. So you get a good feel for the hot spots for these little uh, sections, right? All right. Whew, stand up for a minute my breath for some reason. All right, one more section from week 12, I think. Yeah. And this is just a mishmash of a bunch of different things that we just kind of glance at for a second. Uh, other topics. So what about a compilation of pro forma financial information. Um, so pro forma financial information, if you don't know, is uh, going to show effects of on historical information that might have happened if some transaction had occurred at an earlier date. So we can compile that. That would be under the standards that we're talking about. Um, we could also examine or review those, and that would be under a different set of standards that we'll discuss uh, at a later date. But a compilation of those, just putting them together for them, that's under the standards we're talking about. 
to be able to do it, we must have also compiled or even is fine too if we had obviously gone farther than compiled and we reviewed or audited their financial statements on which this information is based. We are required under a compilation to read it for obvious material mis for obvious material errors. Um, no assurance is given, don't have to be independent. That is a compilation, right? Each page of the financial information should include a reference such as see the accountant's compilation report. No real new information here other than what is it? What is a compilation of pro forma? Other than that, it's a compilation. You don't have to be independent. Uh, kind of lean on what you already know, right? Uh, supplemental information involved in a compilation or review. Uh, if that is something that exists, we would stick an other matter paragraph commenting on whether our compilation or review was performed on the supplementary information. These are long shot question areas here, but quick read, never heard anybody. What about preparing or compiling prospective financial information? So that's going to refer to financial information about the future. We are only allowed to prepare or compile such information. We are not allowed to review it. How would you, right? Um, and then obvious things for the most part. Um, well, maybe not obvious, but we have to have a statement that these forecasted results may not be achieved. And we need a statement that we, the accountant, assumes no responsibility to update the report for matters occurring after the date of the report. We need to have restricted distribution of this thing. Um, if it's a uh, projection, and there's kind of a subtle difference with a projection versus a forecast. And I feel like we're getting too deep and nitpicky at this point, but if it's a projection, you got financial statements given uh, one or more hypothetical assumptions, such as what would happen if this, a forecast is based on assumptions, reflected expected conditions. I don't feel like this is that important, but a projection has to be restricted distribution. A forecast can be more general. We expect the things to happen for a forecast. With a projection, it's like, hey, what if this happens? You have to be careful with that kind of thing. And then they emphasize again, a review is not permitted. Uh, we can do uh, agreed upon procedures engagement under it. We hadn't talked about those yet, so no big deal. This last little section is an important thing to note. And this has come up in our test questions here when we talked about it in an earlier section. And I did notice a couple of people missed it this week. If you've got comparative financial information presented, your report needs to cover every year presented. So the, you know, we have audited the financial statements. And, you know, Lost the language. Um, years ended, goodness, December 31st, 2020 and 2019. You got to include it all. So any report should always refer to every period presented. And this section really, I think, is making more of a point that you don't have to have the same type of engagement for each period presented. You might have a compilation and other might be a review or an audit. And your report would cover all of that. So tell what's going on. Uh, let's look at all these questions. They're worth glancing at. Number one, an accountant has been engaged to compile pro forma financial statements. 
during the accountant's acceptance procedures, it is discovered that the accountant is not independent with respect to the company. So you're reading that and you're thinking, okay, compilation, don't need to be independent. But if I'm not independent, I need to make sure and state that I'm not independent. You know, as I'm doing tests, that's kind of what my mind does. I'm thinking about what the potential, where it's kind of maybe leading me in that way. I kind of know what I'm looking for. So it says, what action should the accountant take? The answer is they should disclose the lack of independence in the accountant's compilation report. Don't have to discuss it with legal counsel. It's pretty clear that we don't have to be independent for a compilation. Definitely don't have to withdraw. That's not necessary either. Number two, a CPA is reporting on comparative financial statements. We audited prior year's financial statements and we reviewed the current year. So we got an audit last year, review this year. So we got to cover all that in the report. A lot of detailed things we got to say, but it says the CPA has added a separate paragraph to the review report to describe the responsibility assumed for the prior year's audited financial statements. The separate paragraph should indicate what, and then you may not know exactly what you have to do off the top of your head. There's gonna be a lot of questions that are that way. It's like, I don't know. But then you can read all four of those and you'd be like, well, definitely it's gonna be this because why wouldn't it be? And these other three don't make sense. So should it indicate the type of opinion expressed previously? So you'd be like, maybe, don't see why not. It makes sense that it should but then you'd read the others to make sure that you wouldn't want to do those. So would we want to have in the report a paragraph that says that we did not update the assessment of control risk? Have you seen anything like that this semester? No, that's not the kind of thing we would do. Would we want to indicate in the report why we went from an audit to a review? No, doesn't matter. All that matters is we did an audit and we did a review and here's the stuff, right? Do we need a statement that the audit report should not be relied upon? Of course not. It can be relied on. We audited those years' financial statements. They're fine, right? So A becomes the best answer we know, right? Based on the fact that why wouldn't you and we wouldn't want to do these others. So there'll be a lot you just kind of have to reason through and you may not automatically know that's what test questions are like sometimes. Number three is CPAs engaged to review financial statements. Previously, we audited last year's financial statements and there was an unmodified opinion. We decided to include a separate paragraph in our this year's review report because we plan to present comparative financial statements. Okay, all sounds good. We're not confused about that. This separate paragraph should indicate what? Would we have a paragraph saying that this year's review report is intended solely for the information of management and the board? No, review can be for whoever. Would we want to say that last year's audit report may no longer be relied upon? I already said that's not something we have to do or would do. And it's not true. Would we want to say that no auditing procedures were performed after the date of the 2001 auditor's report? That sounds like something we'd want to do, right? Just to be very clear, these are audited, no audit procedures after that. Now we've reviewed these. That sounds logical, whether we know it or not. We like that answer. Let's look at the last one. Should we have a paragraph indicating that there are justifiable reasons for changing the service from an audit to review? No. We don't have to explain that, so. Good typical CPA type questions that are easy to reason through. Questions about any of this. Pretty easy. I like it. It's fun, kind of easy to read through. So that's uh, week 12.